You're alive. Rabbi? Yeah. You, you are alive. Hey. One of the uh, symptoms that are predicted that describe the days before Mashiach in the Zohar is that the truth will be missing. It won't be uh, minimized, it won't be compromised, it will be missing. It won't be important, it won't be an issue at all. Truth will not be interesting, will not be, will not be considered a, a virtue. Now, usually we take these, um, these descriptions or these symptoms to mean that just before the coming of Mashiach, things are going to be terrible. How terrible? I'll give you a whole list of things. How bad it's going to be. But in that list of things, the chutzpah will be great, the truth will be missing, uh, there'll be poverty, there'll be, there'll be a lack of leadership. It all sounds like chaos. Kind of familiar, no? But each of those symptoms must also be a necessary preparation relevant to Mashiach. It's not just chaos in general or, or negative symptoms in general. Like we're going to be in big trouble. There's going to be a lot of problems and Mashiach is going to fix them all. That's, that's too random. Every symptom has something to do with Mashiach. Is, is in some way not only a preparation for Mashiach, but, but it kind of contributes to the coming of Mashiach. So why would it be necessary that before Mashiach comes, the truth will be completely uninteresting, unimportant to anybody? So if we take a look at the development of the times, the era in which we live. I remember distinctly that in the 50s, people were very serious, responsible, thoughtful, maybe even philosophical. People were looking for the truth and they were confused because there were so many voices claiming to know the truth, to have the truth, to speak the truth. And people were confused. Who am I to believe? Who is really telling the truth? Now, when we say the truth, we don't mean who is honest and who is lying. We don't mean that. Truth with a capital T doesn't, is not the same as honesty. It's not, I really believe what I'm saying. That's not the question. The question is, what you're saying, is it the truth? So you have different religions telling you what the truth is. You have different philosophical schools of thought telling you what the truth is. You have different political uh, philosophies, each claiming that it is the truth. So people were searching back in the 50s. They couldn't find a satisfying answer. So it seems like in despair, they kind of gave up. There is no truth. It's not that there are many truths, there's no truth. Nothing is really true. Whatever suits you, whatever feels right for you, whether it's physically, 
emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. Find your thing and live it. Enjoy it to the maximum. Try it, you'll like it. That was the 60s. So for a decade or more, people were trying to make their way through life on experiment rather than strong principle. <clears throat> it was a peaceful time, more or less. Um, and, and it developed into the belief that there really is no one truth. If it works for you, that's what we call your truth. I'm sitting in an in a airport and this missionary comes over, evangel evangelical, and he gives me a little sermon about the truth of the Bible. That every word in the Bible is true. So I said to him, I know. I'm a Kohen, which means that Aaron is my grandfather, which means that Moses is my uncle and Miriam is my aunt. He was stunned speechless. And he didn't know what to say and he walked away. Question is, he believes and preaches that every word in the Torah is true. That's his message. And yet, when he found out that I'm actually related to the people in the Bible, he was stunned. So obviously when he said that the Bible is true, he, he didn't mean what I, what I thought he meant. There is this belief or this attitude, I take on a religion I believe a certain religion. The religion tells me it's true. So I believe that it's true. And if I believe it's true, then that's what truth means. I mean, what other truth is there? I believe it's true. Why? Well, that's part of what the religion demands, that I believe that it's true. I can believe anything I want. So if I decide to be part of this religion, part of this group, then I believe what they say. So is what they say true? Well, it's as true as we can get. I think it's true. I hope it's true. I accept that it's true. Or it's true my truth, true for me. What does true for me mean? You know, I wear a size seven and uh, five eighths hat. So any hat that size is my, is my kind of hat. It's, it works for me, it fits. So it's my truth. That's pretty much the same as saying there is no truth. Because if my truth is not your truth, then neither of us have the truth. So the first thing we need to know about truth is that it's universal. If it's true, it's true of everyone. If it's true, it's true at all times. And if it's true, then it's true in all places. Otherwise, you're talking about an opinion, you're talking about an emotion, you're not talking about truth.
the coming of Mashiach is the experience of having the absolute truth completely revealed, completely exposed, so that you can't help but see it. Now, if you see the truth, everyone will see it equally. If you have to understand it, then we're not going to understand it equally. To some people, it will make more sense. Some people make less sense. Some people are more philosophical. Some people are less philosophical. If it's something you have to love, well, different personalities, different temperaments. Some will love it more. Some will love it less. So it can't be true. But if we see it, if it becomes so obvious that you can literally see it, then everybody sees it equally. So the definition of the perfected world, the world after Mashiach, is that the truth will be obvious. The condition before Mashiach is that the truth is not obvious. So you can have many different problems. Either you have too many truths competing with each other so that you're confused, or you have a complete disillusionment where you give up on truth, nothing is true, nobody really knows, and then you're reduced to your own experiment and your own experience. And that divides people into fragments. See, at least if you have many truths, how many are you going to have? Five, six, ten? So all of humanity divides up into ten groups. Ten beliefs, ten religions, ten lifestyles. That's not terrible. When you divide seven billion people into ten groups, It's not like we're alone in the world. But when you have no truth at all, and the only way that you find your path is how, you, how it tastes to you, how it feels to you at the moment, then everybody is on their own. Nobody is connected to anybody else, even if we happen to share the same taste and the same belief. We may believe the same thing, but if it's not true to me and therefore also true to you, then it is my experience versus your experience. And even if we're experiencing the same thing, we each experience it separately. We may both enjoy eating a loaf of bread, but you don't feel my enjoyment and I don't feel your enjoyment. I can relate to what you're enjoying because I enjoy it too. But my pleasure and your pleasure are worlds apart. Just like your hunger and my hunger are worlds apart. I don't know if you're hungry unless you tell me. So the, the contrast before Mashiach, after Mashiach, in order for the truth to be absolutely revealed and absolutely clear, there have to be two things. First of all, we have to be convinced that there can be only one truth. And secondly, we have to be convinced that there is a truth. Can't be without a truth. So this is what we've developed. And this is what we've gained in the last era in beginning in the 50s or 60s that yes there is a truth otherwise we're absolutely disastrous and that there can only be one but let's pursue a little more what this notion of truth really means before we start 
deciding what's the truth, let's first understand what we mean by truth. Whether something is true or false may be an issue for many philosophers, like the philosopher with the lantern who went searching for the truth. But for the average person, true and false is not a big concern. What's more of a concern and more of an interest is what appeals to the emotions. See, if you lie to me, if I find out you lied to me, you didn't tell me the truth, I get very upset, I get hurt, I get frightened. It's an emotional reaction. I hate being lied to. I hate being deceived. How dare you lie to me? It's offensive and it's frightening because if I'm misled, if I can be, if I can be confused about matters, I could get hurt. So when I object to lying and I demand the truth, it's coming from an emotional place. I don't really care what the truth is in the abstract. For example, the notion that there are good people and bad people. Good people will do good things, bad people will do bad things. Good people will be nice to you, bad people will hurt you. So that's an issue that emotions can respond to. I get emotional about that stuff. Friendly or unfriendly, that touches me emotionally. Uh, friend or foe, that's not a question of true or false. or in different words, love is appealing, love feels good, hate feels bad. To be loved is nice, to be hated, not so nice. Is love true? See, I'm not asking whether the love is sincere. I'm asking if it's true with a capital T. True love, what does true love mean? It means a lasting, deep, sincere, honest love that has nothing to do with truth. Truth is, if someone loves you, you don't care if it's true. It feels wonderful. Yes, you do care if it's honest because you don't want to be hurt. You see, again, that's not a question of true or false. It's a question of pleasure and pain. So, for example, somebody comes up with a theory. A very good theory. But then the scientist comes along and says, well, how do we know that that's true? So, well, think about it. Isn't it logical? Yeah, it's logical. But how do you know it's true? In science, the word true means a law, a consistent, repeatable law. If your theory turns out to be true, it means that you can rely on it, that it will always be there, it will not change on you, it will not disappear on you. It is true. Nobody's talking about honest. I'm not asking whether the scientist is honest, although it's a good question anyway, but it's a different question, different subject completely. The, the, the scientist himself 
Mr. Einstein comes up with a theory, a mathematical equation. It sounds wonderful, convincing, profound, deep, amazing. Is it true? Will it stand up to a test? Will it prove to be true or not? Because many good theories till the last minute sounded really nice. The only problem was that it wasn't true. Let's make a better distinction. Is it true, for example, that um, what goes up must come down? Well, what do you mean by true? Is it our experience that when we throw things up, they all fall down? Pretty much, yeah. Does that make it true? So let's make a distinction between fact and truth. True means more than real, because facts are real. Fact is what goes up comes down. It's a fact, a rather consistent fact, which is where we get our notion of gravity. So, if I say what goes up must come down, is that a fact? Yeah, it's a fact. Is it the truth? No, it's not the truth. Because the two realities, one called fact and one called truth, are very different from each other. Fact is a reality that happens to be. The facts on the ground, that's what happens to be. Truth means a reality that must be. It doesn't just happen to be this way. This is the way it must be. I guess a simple example. Human beings are inherently good. True or false? True. Uh, the average human being is basically good. Fact? No. It's not a fact. Fact is people are pretty selfish. Fact is people are pretty, are pretty dishonest, greedy, weak. That's the fact. So, which reality do we go with? Truth says that human beings are basically good. Fact says, no, they're not. Uh, another example, Jews don't eat pork. True or false? Absolutely true. You've never met a Jew who eats pork? Oh yeah. So Jews do eat pork. Well, yeah, that's a fact. But Jews don't eat pork, that's the truth. In other words, if things were true to their, to their truth, they would be different than they are in fact. So the world as we know it is a divided world. It's an unhealthy world because the fact being real isn't always the same as the truth, which is real. So you have two realities, but one truth. Why should that be? How did this, how did that, how did this happen? How did truth get lost and somehow be replaced by fact. So now, what are we talking about when we say truth? What is true doesn't necessarily feel good. 
what is true is not necessarily popular. In fact, <laughs> truth is hardly ever popular. So here's what we have now. The human being possessed of intelligence has an interest in knowing the truth. And because of their intelligence, human beings are repelled or repulsed by falseness. Not by dishonesty, by false. You know, a, peop a person has a deep belief and then finds out that it's not true. That can be more devastating than any physical illness. It pulls the rug out from under you and, and it, it it destroys you from within. That's why some people are afraid to have any deep beliefs, any, any commitments to a truth is a little scary. So we see that there is this instinct in a human being. Tell me the truth. What's the truth? What are they asking for? Tell me the way things ought to be. I know how things are. I don't like it. Most people will tell you that the world must become better than it is now. This is as good as it gets? No. How do you know that? Maybe it is as good as it gets. Why are you disappointed when people do bad things? Why are you disappointed when tragedy strikes? That's the way it is. It's the way it is. Some people actually say, have the courage to admit that life stinks. And that's just the way it is. That is not intelligent. That's the self-defense mechanism. I am protecting myself from any disappointment. So rather than look for a truth and be disappointed, there's no truth, this is life, this is the way it's been, it will always be like this. There will always be war, there will always be crime. That's it. What is it in the human mind and heart that rebels against that? Can't accept that. It's got to get better than this. So first of all, <clears throat> that is a perfect definition of Mashiach. What is it exactly the belief in Mashiach? The belief in Mashiach is it's got to get better than this. Not I hope it'll get better. It has to. This cannot be the truth, even though it's a fact. That's what has helped us survive the worst times in our history. It's not enough to hope for better days. You have to be absolutely convinced that there must be better days. Not just because I don't, I don't like the pain, not just because I want something better, but because there is something true and this is not it. We are not the way we're meant to be. That's the truth. Truth means the way it's meant to be, even if it's not that way today. So the conviction and the belief that the world will get better, we will have peace on earth. Where does that come from? From the conviction that there is a truth beyond the fact. Now, here's the amazing thing. The Alter Rebbe introduced the thinking of Chabad with a very simple statement. We have a godly soul and we have a human soul. The human soul is a fact. I have to eat, I want to eat, I'm tired, I got to sleep, I need some money, I need... That's 
Those are the facts of life. Is that how it's meant to be? I have to depend on food in order to stay alive. I have to depend on drink. I have to depend on sleep, on other people supporting me. I know it's true with a small t, but is it the truth? This is the way it must be. A human being must depend on vegetables. That's not the truth. That can't be. So for all of history, as far back as anybody can remember, we were told that there is a good inclination and a bad inclination. And you got to fight the bad inclination and choose the good. That's an emotional appeal. Nobody said that the good is true and that the bad is false. They said the good brings benefit. The bad brings disaster. So you're appealing to my emotions. My greed for reward and my fear of pain, of punishment. The Altadeb came along and said, no, we have a godly soul and we have a human soul. And the difference between them is the godly soul talks truth. The godly soul appreciates truth, is always looking for the truth. The human soul just wants what works. I don't care if it's true. Give me something that works for me. Whether it's a religion, a belief, a philosophy, a, polit a political system, or, or a meal. If it works for me, I'm content. So if you promise me that I'll get to heaven if I behave myself, okay, I hear you. It speaks to me. If you threaten me that I'm going to go to hell if I don't behave, you got to me. I'm impressed. I don't care if it's true or false. But if you have a godly soul and an animal soul, then one of your souls does care about true and false. You see, the human soul is mortal. It's afraid of dying. And that's why it will, it will respond to anything that uh, supports life and will run away from anything that threatens life. The godly soul is immortal. It's not afraid of dying because it's not going to die. Then what are the godly soul's issues? What does it run towards and run away from? It runs towards truth and it runs away from anything that is not true. And what is not true? What works for you isn't necessarily true. So only the mind has an appreciation for true and false. The heart just thinks of pleasure and pain, agony and ecstasy. True and false is an issue that exists only in intelligence. Like the example of, of, the, of the scientist. If I figure out that two and two is four, why do I still need to prove it? And say, let's see, if two and two is really four, then four minus two should be two. It is, okay, I've proven my theory. Why does the mind check itself? Because the mind wants truth. Emotions just want what feels right. So now we understand a little bit. What does Chabad mean? Chabad means pursue truth. 
Worship God because he is true, not because he'll be nice to you. Don't worship idols, even if they're nice to you, but they're false. And they're false because they don't care about truth. They never even really claim to be true. They just claim to be beneficial. This will be good for you. Try it, you'll like it. That's pure emotional. So there is talk these days about dismantling the police. It sounds so nice. After Mashiach comes, there won't be police. So you might say that not having police or not needing police, that's the truth. That's the way the world ought to be, must be. Fact is that there is still crime in the world and so on, so you have to have police. So again, there's a clash between truth and fact. To dismantle police today would factually be wrong, but it would be the truth. So how do we bring the truth and the fact together? Human beings should not need policemen to, to control their behavior. They shouldn't need a threat of punishment, imprisonment, electric chair. Why do we need that? Fact is we do. So when will the fact finally grow up and become the truth? So there's this beautiful example of a young man who came from Russia to Minnesota and he took a drive out into the country and he came back believing in God. Although he was raised an atheist. What happened? He sees this little booth on the side of the road and there are shelves, tables and bushels full of vegetables. So he wants to buy vegetables. He stops and he waits for the owner to show up. Nobody shows up. He waits, he waits, nobody shows up. And then he notices that there's a can nailed to the wall and there's money in it. And he realized what he was seeing. The farmer had put out the vegetables. They were marked with a price and there was a can for you to put the money into. People took what they wanted, paid for it, and drove off. And the owner didn't even bother coming around. He was stunned. He couldn't believe it. This would never happen in Moscow. The money would be gone instantly. The fruits would be gone second. And, and even the booth, the table, the, the wood, it would all be gone. See, that's where you need a dictator. You need a dictator when people are not governed by what's true. So you have to enforce the law because you can assume that people are not going to be honest. What he saw there on the side of the road in rural Minnesota, he saw people behaving according to God's plan. There were no policemen, there were no cameras, the farmer wasn't there hovering to make sure you don't make off with one of his cucumbers. There's an eye that sees and an ear that hears that objects to stealing. And that's always been and it always will be. It's true. And because of that truth and because of that awareness, people will actually put money in the can when they, when they take a, a vegetable and, and not think anything of it. That's the way it is. So can we do without police? We can do without police if we're in touch with truth. If we live by fact, we need police. 
constantly. So it turns out that Chabad <clears throat> is, a, is an indispensable preparation for the coming of Mashiach. Mashiach will be the revelation of truth. Who's going to appreciate it? Who cares when something is true or false? The mind cares. The intelligent soul cares. The emotions don't. So if we live in a world of emotion, there's going to be nothing but ugliness and crime. And that's why the emphasis on reward and punishment should be less and less necessary as we get closer and closer to the truth. So in the, in the study, study of Hasidus, which may be the only philosophy in the world that appreciates the, the, the value of truth and the distastefulness of that which is false. Not because of any repercussions, not because of reward and punishment, but because true is true and false is false. And the truth in me is allergic to that which is false and thrives on that which is true. So whatever is true in me is attracted to the truth and is repelled by substitute reality, which is fact. So today, before Mashiach comes, when the fact surrenders to the truth, like a person is healed from a serious illness. Fact is he could have died from it. Truth is nobody should ever die. So when the illness surrenders to the truth, we call it a miracle. And we have to thank God for that miracle. But when Mashiach comes, it won't be a miracle when fact surrenders to truth, it's the only option. A world that heals is no longer split so that there are no two realities. One reality, the truth is also a fact and the fact is also the truth. So when Mashiach comes, Jews won't eat pork. True, true. Will it be a fact? It'll be the fact. Because you can't have, a, you can't have conflict between fact and truth. And since truth cannot surrender, then the fact is gonna have to surrender to the truth. And that's what we mean by the coming of Mashiach. The coming of Mashiach means that whatever is true will be the fact. And whatever is a fact will be only the truth. In practical terms, what I know I should be, but I'm not, the potential that I carry for goodness that remains potential year after year after year, that's going to change. The goodness that exists will also be the reality every day. And this divide between potential and actual is an unhealthy one. A healed world won't have that, won't tolerate that. So whatever potential goodness there is will become actualized. And whatever potential evil there is will have showed itself, will have revealed itself and will have destroyed itself because evil has no more reason to exist. 
It existed as a fact, never as a truth. So when fact surrenders to truth, we will have a very healthy world. And that is the teachings of Chabad. People who want to learn, there are so many, so many online resources. Learning Hasidus is learning truth because that's what Chabad is. It's not looking for an exper experience. It's not looking for stimulation, not even spiritual stimulation. It's looking for truth. And when you find the truth, you don't need any reward. So now that we've got time, before we're back into the busy world, which hopefully we'll never have to go back to, um, use, use the time. We can't give up on truth. It won't give up on us, so we have no choice. We gotta find it, we gotta know it, and we gotta live it. <laughs>